Hello, everyone. Welcome again. If you're just joining us, um, maybe just one more minute. There's a lot of people joining right now. Bom dia, Monica. Bom dia. Okay, maybe we can start. So, hello, welcome. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Monica Harris. I'm the SMART program manager. It's a huge pleasure to welcome all of you to, um, for this webinar today. Before we start, just some um, quick points. Please make sure you're muted throughout the webinar. You are really welcome to use the chat. Drop us a message, say hello, let us know where you're joining from. This session is being recorded. Uh, we have time for Q&A at the end of the webinar. And we ask you, invite you to please submit your questions using the chat function throughout the presentation today. We will try and answer some of them. Uh, and we will all we also uh, have some that we will answer at the end. Okay. So this is our third webinar in the series, Advances in the Use of Smart Approach Tools just, and Technology. To celebrate Women's History Month, it is my pleasure to welcome you to this really very special webinar in our series, 100% led by women from different parts of the world who will share their smart use cases. From the software development to strategic planning, training, implementation, from patrols and rangers, from biological data collection, monitoring, human wildlife conflict, we have a number of amazing women working with us and using SMART for wildlife conservation all over the world. It is my honor and pleasure to introduce you to some of them today. Joining us from Zimbabwe, Elta B. van der Westhuizen from Frankfurt Zoological Society. My colleagues from WCS Mongolia, Nara and Ordnu. Luisa Maldonado joins us from National Natural Parks of Colombia. Dr. Sibila Klesendorf from WWF is going to talk to us about polar bear in the Arctic. Clarine Kigoli from ZSL joins us from Kenya is joining us from Pantera in Zambia and is going to talk to us about some March patrol. Rumbi Maguiro from Gonaruzu Conservation Trust joins us from Zimbabwe and she's going to talk to us about using SMART with her canine patrol. Dr. Samantha Strindberg, my colleague at WCS, joins us from Sweden. Zia Stevens from Pantera um, is joining us from Zambia. Liling Shu uh, works for WCS and is joining us from the US. Lily Zhu, also in the US from Harvard University. The agenda for today is we're first going to have an overview of SMART, its evolution and current status, and then we'll have a number of case studies um, from different parts of the world. And then at the end, we'll have two presentations focusing on what's in the pipeline, what's next for SMART, one looking at AI to predict coaching and legal logging, and one looking at integration of SMART with a number of different senses, and then we'll have our Q&A. So I'd like to invite my colleague Elsa B to share her screen and start. Hi everyone, um, once again a very warm welcome to today's SMART webinar and showcasing the innovative and interesting ways that SMART is being used to monitor and measure conservation impact across the globe. I'm really excited about today's webinar, the fact that we are hearing from an all-female cast of conservation practitioners across a wide spectrum of conservation roles. I strongly believe that SMART has given a wider platform to women to make an active and significant contribution in a field which traditionally has been very male-dominated. 
And I, for one, look, really, really look forward to hear the special stories today. Before we dive into the case studies, I've been asked to just give a quick overview of what SMART is, where it came from, and where we are today. I promise to be brief, as I'm sure many of you are already very familiar with SMART, but please bear with me as we do have a very diverse audience here today with various levels of background knowledge. Smart Partnership, uh, it's come a long way. It was established in 2011 with the vision to create a suite of practical tools that will meet the needs of conservationists on the ground wanting to make informed data-driven decisions and to measure and improve on their conservation impact. This partnership has grown from an initial seven members to nine leading conservation organizations today. This unique alliance of conservation organizations has enabled us to collaborate on developing the tools, the training, and to give the support that is needed for effective implementation. It has allowed us to harmonize our efforts and to avoid competition, and hereby making the tools widely available to the conservation community. The SMART approach to support conservation areas includes the provision of tools, capacity building, and best practices. The core of SMART is a conservation technology platform with desktop, mobile, and cloud-based components. This platform allows conservationists to collect a range of data relevant for protecting wildlife and wild spaces. This platform is free, it's easy to use, and it has made substantial contributions to nature conservation efforts in over 70 countries and 900 sites worldwide. The smart footprint has really grown um, in the last few years from a small number of pilot sites. It has grown rapidly and is currently being used in a wide variety of contexts and areas, including terrestrial and marine national parks, community conservancies, forest reserves and logging concessions, just to give a few examples. In addition, smart has been adopted by national wildlife authorities in 16 countries to be the default tool of collecting, storing and analyzing data that are collected by their field staff on the ground. In addition to the partnership members, SMART has a wide range of supporters, including organizations and private donors, providing anything from technical to financial support, amplifying the global impact of the SMART approach, and we want support here today. People often ask us, what is SMART? At its core, it remains a database with very powerful analysis functionality that is user-friendly and which provides support for multiple languages. One of its very important features is that it has built-in mapping and spatial analysis ability to visualize and better understand and communicate the results. SMART is also increasingly able to integrate data from other sources, including external sensors, allowing it to become near real-time or real-time view, view of what is happening in the field. A key component of SMART is its ability to generate, enables managers to easily access their data in a format that informs and feeds into the adaptive management cycle and capacitates them to make better strategic decisions. It is important to emphasize that SMART is more than just software. It is an integrated approach that not only includes the software tools, but also relies on capacity building and support based on rigorous standards. Initially, SMART was very much focused on measuring and improving ranger patrol effectiveness quality and management, thereby promoting accountability and good governance. It plays a role in, the, in adaptive management by aiming to fully support and facilitate each step of the cycle, and is typically used as a law enforcement monitoring tool for measuring performance of patrol efforts and documenting results of patrols and other protection activities. Its numerous functionalities and modules have fully support and facilitate each step of the adaptive management cycle, the field, the automated data entry, robust analysis, semi-automated reporting, and strategic planning. For many practitioners, the powerful analysis tools built into SMART has been one of the key features that have made a significant difference in the way in which they are able to communicate the impact that they are having, measuring the threats and generating information that can be fed into activity and funding strategies. SMART has since evolved into a holistic protected area management system, including mobile, desktop and online platforms with a wide range of application in conservation practices. I won't preempt the information that will be shared by our presenters today, but suffice to say that SMART continues to evolve to meet the needs of modern conservation and a broad range of conservation practitioners far beyond the initially envisaged scope. 
For those of you who would like to access, to access more information about SMART and the SMART partnership, you can make use of the. And I would specifically urge you to become part of the SMART User Forum, which is a growing and dynamic group of worldwide SMART users exchanging ideas, solutions, and other relevant sources. I would now like to give the floor to the first of our presenters today, and we will be hearing from Odo and Nara about the role of SMART for anti-poaching in the small Gobi Reserve in Mongolia. Thanks very much. Over to you. Please, Nara. Yeah. Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, first of all, thank you for inviting this wonderful webinar. And uh, uh, I'm Danara, and the Conservation Technology Officer in Mongolia. And there is a, also um, Natural Law Enforcement Manager uh, is Adna is here. So uh, we're gonna more focus on the woman power in the Gobi desert and in a small Gobi strictly protected area in Mongolia. So using the SMART for the anti poaching projects. So first of all, I'm gonna to introduce a little bit about the small Gobi strictly protected area. So it was established in 1996 and also one of the world's endangered species uh, representing there. So such as wild ass, the goitered gazelle and snow leopard. And also uh, SPAs uh, included the three different zones, the core zones and protection zones and limited use zones. And SPA is located in the southern part uh, of Mongolia. You can see the map and uh, it's bordered to the China and more zooming is uh, included in different two parts, part A and part B. And also it's around 1 million 800 hectares and around 19 rangers and using the two times um, petrol fields, using the smart mobile and using motorcycle and dragged phones and riding a horse. And it's a little bit history of the smart in Mongolia. So we started in 2014 and until 2015, we uh, set up our the basement of the smart approach. Uh, it's a theoretical lessons. And since 2016, we officially start with the smart software program and using the patrol forms and GPS. And in 2017, we used the cyber tracker, but it's an English version. So it's very hard for using the rangers because the, our rangers have no uh, background of the English word, uh, language. So that's why we finalized the translation in software, Mon uh, software into the Mongolian in 2019. And all the brochures and the um, manuals, the programs are translated into the Mongolia. So, after that, it's very um, easy to use the rangers. And then 2020, we start from uh, using the smart mobile. So uh, also you can see that the brochure of the Mongolian versions and there is a, our only one woman ranger. And she is Inkchimik. Uh, she was born in Gobi Desert and uh, heard a woman and he, her family has a livestock uh, such as camels, the herds, sheep, and also they produce in dairy products and keeps the Mongolian Gobi uh, nomadic lifestyle. Also, she lives uh, very close to the SPA. And also her father was the first ranger in the small Gobi SPA and he knows all the areas very well and locally honored. And she often joins the him for the field monitoring and the visit the many important habitats of the wildlife. And also she gains a lot of knowledge and experience from her father. And after the passing away of her father, she was decided to continue his position and works more than 10 years now in a small Gobi strictly protected area. And since 2016, she attended capacity building of program and learning very quickly smart uh, programs and equipment. And now she is a, our best ranger of the small Gobi strictly protected area. 
Also, she works close with the local herders, providing the environmental laws and the gathered information uh, against the poaching and other environmental violations. And she works close to the border guards, sharing a lot of information about the environmental issues. And how is she working? Okay, she uh, mainly focused around 19,000 hectare kilometers. So average petrol uh, kilometer is 200 kilometers. She using the motorcycle and also riding the horse and patrol times is four times in a month and she collecting the data. And you can see the summary of the observations and she doing the three different uh, patrolling. The, the first one is uh, she doing the patrolling during the uh, limited zones. You can see the green um, area. This is a limited zone, our protected areas. And the second one is she doing the patrol in the pr protection zone. You can see the purple area, this is a protection zone. And the third one is, you can see the pinky one, this is our main car zone, she doing the patrol in car zone. So our the rangers also she doing the patrol in different three zones. Uh, so this is a um, last five years of the Inchimix uh, patrol efforts, and you can see the number of values in during the last five years. And you can see the map. This is observed wildlife of the ink chimics in the last five years. The most of the uh, wildlife is um, gutted gazelle, and the yellow one is uh, wild as is the holang. So, um, what about other rangers? So uh, I'm gonna include the two map about all the rangers, including the Inchimix. And this is the last year result of all the rangers of the small Gobi protected area. So you can see the uh, all the rangers patrol track using the smart mobile or and uh, also this, this area is Inchimix area and you can see other rangers track in the strictly protected area. And this is one the the number of values. And this one maps shows that observed wildlife of the small copy is being in 2020. And there was a recorded one carcass, but it's a um, not poached carcass. So, and most of the uh, wildlife is observed in, uh, recorded in the petrol form. It's uh, goitered gazelle and the wild ass. And you can see the map, the pink one is Gotchard Castle and the yellow one is uh, Holang, the wild ass. Our main um, goal is decreasing the carcass of the uh, uh, poached. So you can see the graph and uh, the correlation between patrol affairs and the carcass numbers. And the red line is carcass numbers and you can see the decreasing and the patrol number is uh, increasing and it means that if the patrol quality is increasing while the registered poached carcass is decreasing. So this is our result. And also another one res main our uh, goal is uh, increasing the population size of the our protected animals. So uh, you can see this slide from uh, this is a trend of abundance of uh, holang and the goitered gazelles and uh, between 2013 and 2019. And of course you can see the uh, increasing year by year. So this is a result which we are aiming for it. So we are satisfied that and results are excellent improving year by year. And smart approaches give us a lot of opportunities which are easy to monitoring and analyzing, reporting, planning, and all the tools in one device and softwares. So also we are aiming to implement uh, another strictly protected area in Mongolia. It's ongoing process and also uh, implementing the smart connect in the future. Yeah. That's it and thank you for attention. Thank you. Any questions? Mm -hmm. 
Thanks. I think we'll be taking questions afterwards. Thanks very much, Nara yeah. Odin. That's fascinating. Uh, those numbers are, are, are amazing. What, 50,000 plus gazelles, et cetera. That's, that's quite something. Um, thank you. I think we're going to go straight ahead. I'm going to be talking to Clarine um, from Kenya. And thank you very much, Clarine. You can share your screen now. Hello, can you see my screen? Uh, yes, yes, we can. Thank you very much, Clarine. You can go ahead. Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Clarine Kigoli, a smart trainer at ZSL and user council lead and member of uh, training task force at the Smart Partnership. And I'm going to, uh, to talk about smart training. So why smart training? Uh, smart training is a key component of smart implementation process. It is very important to receive training on smart before implementation. The smart partnership has three pillars, which are effective software tools, rigorous standards, and capacity building. Through capacity building, we have seen effective management of protected areas and community areas. And through rigorous standards, smart ideas to a set of protection standards. For example, establishing a patrol database will not on its own improve protection in a conservation area. In addition to smart software and database, basic enforcement capacity and infrastructure must be in place. So uh, talking of best practices, SMART applies best practices compiled from sites across the globe by people with on-ground experience in implementing law enforcement monitoring systems. Practitioners learn from lessons learned across, across different sites. So uh, on this slide, I want to talk about uh, how we have institutionalized SMART at the College of Wildlife Management in Mweka in Tanzania. So to build capacity, which is one of the SMART partnership pillars, we have institutionalized SMART at the College of African Wildlife Mweka in Tanzania. That is in East Africa, for those who do not know. The project in Tanzania is a WCS project in partnership with the college, which started in 2018. The college has integrated SMART in their curriculum and the SMART course is being offered to rangers taking diploma and certificate courses. Uh, this slide here talks about the project objectives of institutionalizing SMART at the College of African Wildlife Management. So number one, to work with uh, QAM fa faculty, the SMART partnership and other trainers to develop training materials and adapt existing SMART materials for use in East Africa. Number two is to conduct smart basic user training and specialist training in, mo in mobile data collection and adaptive protected area management to selected core group of up to 20 staff selected by, by the college. Number three is to conduct training of trainers workshop to enable selected staff to train others in the park system in Tanzania and other parts of East Africa and to help supervise initial training exercise run by the college trainers. So who are the target? Our target group are people working in protected areas, institutions, community areas, and those using SMART for specific species research. So um, depending on, on institution structure in terms of levels, park wardens, conservancy managers, admins, and researchers or practitioners undergo a full course on SMART, which includes database setup, data collection, analysis, reporting, and adaptive management. And on that note, I'd like to mention that we have received some funding from a generous private donor helping SMART, and therefore we will be able to dramatically increase the number of trainings and improve quality by having more materials and translation in the next three years of the project. Thank you to our private donor. 
So what is being taught? In our basic smart training, we teach on conservation area setup, data model management, roles and responsibilities, data collection with smart mobile, data analysis, reporting and planning modules. In advanced training, we teach on Smart Connect, uh, which is an online extension of smart desktop where a server is needed and can be hosted uh, locally, can be on local server or hosted. Devices are then configured to send data and alerts in real time, thus improving management effectiveness. We also do a speciality training. We also do speciality training that is on ecological records and smart profiles. And for those who are not aware of smart profiles, it is a plugin designed to allow the secure storage management and analysis of information that is not typical of the COSMAT. It is built to track individual entities in time and space and to capture relationships between entities. And lastly, in Kenya, ZSL has been training its partners on using SMART for HWC management and curbing IWT in the communities bordering the Savo National Parks. So how are our courses taught? Like I've mentioned before, we have institutionalized SMART in the College of African Wildlife in Tanzania. And there, for those interested in learning SMART, for example, can go to this, this institution and learn SMART. We also deliver trainings at venues, e.g. conferences in specific places where we announce for smart course participation. And we also do field-based training where training is done on site and practicals are done within the conservation area. In this COVID area, the partnership has really tried to offer webinars on, on smart, which have been very useful. So uh, watch this space and keep on um, subscribing. Outcomes of our trading. Uh, here are some of the out outcomes we have had with our training. So number one, talking about the number of people trained, we have in increased our numbers and a wider audience has been reached through SMART trainings. People who did not know uh, the power of SMART are now interested in implementing the tool after training. Another outcome we have seen through our training is that we have more protected areas and other sites in Africa now adapting SMART for protected area management. Yeah. Uh, Clarine, just make sure that you're unmuting yourself. Hello? Yes, we can hear you now, Clarine. Okay. Do I repeat the, the, the slide? I think, yeah, yes, please, if you can just repeat. Okay, yeah, so uh, I was talking about the outcomes of the training. Uh, so talking about the number of people trained, uh, we have increased our numbers and, and a wider audience has been reached through SMART trainings. People who did not know the power of SMART are now interested in implementing the tool after training. Uh, another outcome uh, we have seen through our trainings is that we have more protected areas and sites in Africa now adapting uh, SMART for protected area management, law enforcement, and anti-poaching, biomonitoring, and even species research. We have seen improved results from using SMART at sites where trainees came from. For example, uh, improved protected area management, uh, whereby patterns of efforts in relation to results have informed management on how resources are being managed and drive the decisions to quickly decide where resources need to be reallocated or if additional resources need, are needed in that particular protected areas. Secondly, uh, we have also seen improved conservation effectiveness through SMART, whereby conservation targets have been defined 
and monitored specifically to know if targets are flourishing. We have also a number of marine protected areas deploying SMART. And uh, lastly, we have seen a lot of potential of uh, expanding SMART in community areas. Uh, lastly, uh, this slide, just to add on, talks about results we have achieved through institutionalizing SMART at the College of Wildlife, Mweka. Uh, number one, instructions. Uh, sorry, uh, inst instruct instructors. There seems to be a problem here. Sorry, okay, yeah, there we go. So this slide here talks about some of the uh, uh, results we have achieved at the College of Wildlife Mweka. Nine instructors at the college and patiency recruited as traders to teach smart software, including advanced plugin and capable of training students and government staff. Short courses conducted in data collection methods for students, uh, those who are taking diploma and uh, diploma and certificate courses. Number three, short courses in law enforcement monitoring, including specific instruction in use of smart database for data management and reporting. Number four, ranger focus training in development at the Paciency Wildlife Training, which is, uh, we are introducing smart there. Uh, number five, provision of computers and smartphones for use in classroom and practical training courses. Yeah, thank you for listening to me. Thanks very much for that, uh, um, Clarine. That was really great to hear. I mean, I think to see smart training being institutionalized like this is just amazing. Um, the capacity building and really being able to roll it out is going to be the what makes it successful in the long run. And I think, again, Mweka office as not as uh, and some of these in the College of African Wildlife Management really being at the forefront here. Thanks. I think we'll go over to Colombia now and be hearing from Luisa Maldonado about the use of SMART in National Natural Parks of Colombia. Thanks very much. Um, Luisa, you can go share your screen now. Okay, hello, everybody. You can see my screen now. Thanks, yeah, yes, we can. Okay, thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm Luisa Maldonado on behalf of the National Natural Park. We appreciate the invitation of WCAs and I'm so happy to represent the Women's Park Ranger in Colombia. I'm going to introduce you to uses of SMART in the protect areas in the National Natural Park of Colombia. Colombia is located in the intertropical zone in the extreme northwest of South America, and our territory is distributed in almost 50% terrestrial and 50% sea, with marine territory in the Caribbean Sea and in the Pacific Ocean. As Environmental Authority National Natural Park coordinates the national system on protect area that is called CNAP, and additionally administer and manage 62 areas with different types of protect categories adopted from UECN. These 62 protect areas represent approximately 20 million hectares of the Colombian territory. In response, to the need to achieve greatness effectiveness in the management, control, and investigation of the protect areas, Natural Natural Park is led us to implement the smart pattern model that is called for laws enforcement monitoring for smart, and this other mod uh, model that is the ecologic record model. I'm going to show you, oh sorry, I don't know if I check. Okay, now I'm going to start with the module of 
uh, law enforcement um, that we, we call patrol model. Colombia began the implementation of, of SMART in 2014 and during the control and patrol uh, monitoring in three protect areas. As you can see, the areas with the smart uses were increased from three in 2014 until 2018, we have eight, uh, 58 protect areas implement smart with this model patrol during the control and surveillance um, in these 58 areas. The novelty in 2018 were the smart connect pilots in two PAs. This scheme continued until now. And for the last year in 2020, we start uh, the smart connect pilots in, in two areas. But the last year, sorry, we officially, officially start the implementation of Flowin Psychological Record for monitoring and investigation in El Tuparro National Natural Park. For the process of the implementation that patrol model, Colombia uh, during this process have a niche Project area has received technical support from WCS and in, it has quite a strong project areas leadership part. Now invest into the part management with improved control in each project areas. Automatization of formats and reports, optimizing par ranger works. Quick appropriation of the tool in the natural natural part is really useful. And we are develop of one control board in RGS online to visualize and implement general statistic of the patrol and identify pressure during the control patrol work. For this uh, control board, I'm going to show you here that this control board provides the consolidated information of patrol in the 58 protect areas that are using SMART and have the statistic of indication of each area, each of these 158, and identify pressure with the area and in the and inside the area and in around the area in the inference area. We can see too the details of each area. For example, generate reports of which are the most frequent pressures that this area have, current status of say the pressure and their respective specialization. This allows inform uh, is really useful for making decision by the authority. These results are achieved with continuous work between National Natural Park and WCAs of Colombia. The other model that we are implementing is the ecologic records. Um, but before SMART, Colombia was using uh, from 2014 until 2019, we are implement the ecological system in the system of monitoring and investigation called SULA. In SULA covers 12 topics, different topics. And in this uh, platform, we have many data structures, uh, data sets, and a thousand of records. During the 2018 and 2019, uh, El Tuparro Park explored the ecological record model in the framework of the GEF project using a smart ecological record. And for that reason, in 
2019, the institution have was made, uh, the decision was made to unify the tools to use only the smart ecology record model. And then for 2019, we start use this other um, model for, for smart. Um, additionally, we developed two regional pilot workshop in five project areas, uh, implement the bar pilot model and in another eight areas with poly with pilot model of hydrate resource. This is scheme uh, for migration of information from SULA to SMART is using Darwin Core standard that for facilitate the, the, the use of the information in different uh, platforms. During 2020, uh, we achieve migration of 50% of solar register to SMART uh, with 26 models of general thematic data with the standardized variables with Darwin Core Standard 2. And we developed three pilots validate in field with these topics. Uh, additionally, we do three virtual workshop to territorial uh, directories and the protect areas in, in the different protect areas. Okay, now the process of the implementation uh, of the ecologic record model in natural natural park start with the selection of the variables of the monitoring program that is part of the management plan of each PA. This, this data is, this, all these attributes collected in SULA monitoring information are reviewed and standardized using the Darwin Core, like I said before. The data feeding into, into, into national database and global register is like a unique library that attribute is generated for the National Natural Park. And these instructions are already built. The data models of different attributes as a field book for monitoring for customized study designs by protect areas. And this uh, needs constant training. The information that contains the previous monitoring system is migrated directly to a SMART through a simplified data model. And finally, we can generate queries for the analysis for different kinds of information. This um, progress is made to connection between SMART and we are start to review the R studio for analysis of the indicators too. This is the um, information management of the ecologic register model. Uh, recognizing the monitoring programs and research portable that respond to the conservation objective of the areas in each management plan, we uh, start with the smart design and general configuration of data model was generated with specific attributes and categories. And then that goes to the device with user data model and cyber tracker. And for that, we study design with samples unit and samples properties. And this is implemented in the file to later integrate the smart desktop local for generating information in the different kind of report, uh, institutional report, national report, and uh, global record. All this process allows 
us to make informed management decisions. This is the other example that the control board give us uh, for the module of ecological record. Uh, allows to visualize indicator of the biodiversity, such as richness, abundance, density by ecosystem, amongst others, which allow evaluating the condition of a species or ecosystem for the conservation. Uh, also capture and specialization of pressure and sightings of species prioritizes in the protected areas. Uh, um, okay, that's it. Now, just uh, for the challenge that we are recognizing this process, we need to continue capacitation per uses roles. Uh, now it's, it's really useful the virtual capacita capacitation platforms with models, continuous management to strengthen teams, implementation of different components in fights and under different conditions, the protect areas, visualizing indicator resource um, with all that I, I show you like uh, the control dashboard and the annual monitoring and investigation report is really, uh, really useful for the management too. Now we, we need to finish the migration. Oh my God. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Finish the migration process from Sula to SMART regarding monitoring and investigation data, upload historical information without systematization, and the automatization visualization of biodiversity information with uh, some platforms like GBA. Okay, now we would like to specially say thanks to WCA's um, Colombia because this process it will not be possible without the continuous support for the implementation, capacitation, and accompaniment from from National Natural Park, and also without WCA's smart could not be sustained in the long term. And for these other organizations, uh, the supporting the process of mobile device and resource to make capacitation is really important for maintain and implement correctly and effectively this tool that is really useful for us that we are the Environmental Authority in Colombia. Just for finalize, this is really important information for management. Use the technology tools to support the world of the Park Ranger, training in connection with other kind of analysis like R Studio. It's important of content training and capacity building for the use of the tool. Um, that's it. Thank you very much. We are the conservation people from Colombia. Thank you for listening me. Thanks very much for that, Louisa. I think it's yeah, truly inspiring to see a national rollout and at that scale. And, and I think it's something we can all aspire to. And uh, it's also good to have some input in from people using the ER module. I think it's not been as widely implemented as some of the other smart toolbox um, uh, software tools. So it's great to see that. And uh, I specifically also enjoyed the ability to see the interaction and uh, compatibility with other software such as ArcGIS and being able to use it in such a sort of innovative way. So thanks very much for Colombia there. Uh, we're going to go to Zambia now and be listening to a presentation by Chulwe on smart in Zambia and how it is. Thanks over to you Chulwe, you can screen. Hey everyone, are you able to see my screen? Yes, all good, we can hear you and we can see your screen. Thanks, you can go ahead. 
Okay, so thank you so much. Uh, my full name is uh, Chorum Linga. I'm the Panthero RIF Smart Coordinator for Zambia as well as Zimbabwe. I'm really excited to share my experience on how SMART has been able to change the patrolling system within Zambia. Chulwe, maybe okay. you can just go into presenter mode. You've got your on the slideshow at the moment. Oh, okay. Let me just, all right. Is that okay? Can you all hear yes. me? Yeah, that's all good now. Thanks, uh, Chulwe, you can go ahead. Yes. Hey, so thank you. I'm going to start with the overview of the SMART program itself within Zambia. So SMART has been adopted by several different national parks within Zambia. It is an applied data management tool that has been used for solving practical problems in natural resources conservation across landscapes in Zambia. The main stakeholders that have been used uh, that have been used or responsible for the implementation of SMART across different national parks is the Department of National Parks and Wildlife, as well as conservation NGOs. So SMART has been used for a wide range of different conservation activities, of which the first one is the anti-poaching patrols. We have human wildlife conflict. We also have the biodiversity monitoring, such as uh, spore transects, camera trapping, as well as individual animal tracking. We also have a program that is called the Citizen Science Program that is currently using Smart and Kafue National Park, and it is used to uh, you know, show the locations as well as the movement of cars within, within Kafue National Park. Over the years that we have been able to implement Smart on Ground, we have been able to conduct training and upliftment for accurate data collection of wildlife police officers, as well as community scouts. We have also been able to upscale within conservation NGOs, as well as government for technical data management. We have also been able to facilitate the use of data, the use of SMART for adaptive patrol management. So within all our sites that are using SMART, we have been able to adopt the SMART uh, to adopt the adaptive SMART approach, of which this approach itself, it has got six phases. The first stage is the briefing stage of which our patrol teams are briefed on the data on the deployment day, on the use of you know, the SMART devices themselves, as well as on how to enter the information in patrol data. Then we have the second stage, which is the data collection stage of which our patrol teams collect and record data such as threats, for example, we have apprehensions as well as wildlife sightings. The third stage is debriefing of which our patrol teams report on their patrol activities and patrol data is checked and entered into the smart database. The fourth stage is the data management stage of which the data itself is processed into highly visual tables, charts, as well as the maps showing patrol effort. The fifth stage is the analysis stage of which we have been able to create reports that are showing all our patrol efforts, results, as well as setting up new patrol targets. The last stage is our patrol planning stage of which our patrol plans are created using the up-to-date and informative patrol reports that we have been able to release every single month. So SMART has really helped us to improve our patrolling in a number of ways, of which the first one is the storage of the data itself in a safe and a secure database, of which all our patrol data is now stored in a cloud server. So we don't really have uh, fears of losing the data because it is nicely served on a cloud server. Then we have also standardized data collection methods. As I earlier said, we have been able to conduct a number of data collection trainings that have been able to equip all our patrol teams with the necessary skills on how to use uh, patrol smartphones as well as tablets on how to collect the information in the field. And recently we have been able to introduce uh, basic trainings on how to use the GPS as well as train our patrol officers on how to enter the information in the patrol data form as a way to create a standardized way of data collection methods. 
Then the third one is the accountability of information collected through conducting regular debriefs. So debriefs have been able to create a better work relationship between the officers as well as their superiors, because it has been noted that before SMART was implemented on ground, our field officers found it very difficult for them to interact with their seniors. Therefore, with the coming of the debriefs itself, it has allowed um, our officers to have a better relationship with their superiors and also discuss not only on the data that has been collected, but also on the challenges that they are facing in the field. Then we also have reports. So the reports are created easily in SMART, which is really amazing. And like the old fashioned way of creating operational reports and statistics manually, which takes a lot of time to compile and as well as to analyze. So with SMART itself, we have been able to create standardized reports as well as release those reports on time when it is required. Patrol planning. So SMART has made it easy for us to plan for patrols because it's easy to locate the threatened areas. In time, it has really helped. Um, it has really helped us to understand the dynamics of different threats across different national parks. So SMART has also allowed us to have easy communication across SMART sites with the coming in of SMART Connect itself. So this has really been amazing that we have been able to connect with different SMART users across Zambia, and it's pretty easy for us to share the patrol information and like uh, exporting the patrols out and then sending them via email. But now with the coming in of Smart Connect, it has really made it easy for us to create that better work relationships with um, different smart users across, across Zambia. So with Smart Connect itself, it has also made it easy for us to access reports via the web that is aimed at conservation managers. Okay, so Smart has also been able to improve and measure the performance of positive conservation outcomes. For example, if you look at those two maps there, we have been able to look at where our patrol teams were able to patrol in 2019. And we have also been able to compare those patrols to where our patrol teams have been able to patrol in 2020. So we have been able to use those two maps in order for us to understand the dynamics of which areas that our patrol teams have already covered, and also to plan for the next year and also look at um, other ways of patrolling and how we can improve our patrol, our foot, our foot patrols. Then SMART has also allowed us to have easy access, um, has also allowed us to assess if the protection measures we are undertaking are making an impact over time. So the graph there shows that per 100 kilometers walked, the number of recoveries have reduced from 2018 when SMART was implemented in Papua National Park. So this is really a very great result, and this kind of data can easily be analyzed using SMART. So future plans for SMART in Zambia itself, we, we want to conduct a large SMART debriefers training that will include all the data managers from different national parks across Zambia. We are also hoping to build a strong capacity within the government authority itself and also help out to set, to set up and implement SMART curriculums that can be taught in a standardized module at Zambian Wildlife Colleges. Yeah, so thank you so much for listening to me. Hello. Thanks very much. Hello. Yeah, sorry. Thank you very much. That was great. Uh, I think one thing I picked up uh, is the fact that you pointed out that uh, keeping the data in the cloud has really helped you uh, secure the data, loss of data. And uh, I think it's something a lot of in, uh, organizations has been a bit reluctant, especially the national authorities. And I think if you buy these kind of interactions, being able to show that it is a secure site for sharing, for, for storing data and that it it still remains um, your own date and is not shared with everybody else is, 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 really, is really good and something we can move forward with. Thanks very much. I think from here, from Zambia, we're now going um, straight up to Germany to look at polar bear conflict in the Arctic. Thanks, uh, Sibella. You can go ahead. 
Hi, Anne. Here we go. Everybody can see it? Yeah, great. Thanks. We can see okay. and hear you. Awesome. Yeah. Yep. Greetings from the north, everybody. Um, we are just um, starting to implement now SMART in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, I've been working uh, through WWF with the polar bear range states who have a conservation agreement since the 70s, actually, and have been each doing their own thing in, in data collection on polar bears. But in 2007, based on a conservation agreement, we um, decide to standardize what we're doing in the Ar Arctic range states. And one of the reasons is that we're experiencing really rapid range uh, change in the Arctic. Um, it's predicted that by 2035, the Arctic will be ice-free in the summers. And that of course changes dramatically what polar bears do since uh, the sea ice is their main habitat. So with the disappearing ice, bears spend much more time on land and that means more interactions with people and increasing polar bear human conflicts. Um, of course, you know, the, the main thing that's been happening is polar bears coming into communities um, when they spend time on land and they um, looking for food, um, are curious oftentimes uh, with the different smells. And that, of course, is a, a dangerous situation. Um, it's not just polar bears that are coming ashore and waiting for the ice to refreeze. It's also a lot of other species here, for example, the walrus. And in these situations, also there are, um, are carcasses that attract polar bears that lead to conflicts in very close proximity to, to communities. Um, communities have, of course, lived with uh, polar bears for forever and for um, have had um, interactions with polar bears, but the number of, of conflict cases and some of the severity seems to be increasing. Um, over the years, um, we from WWF and other conservation organizations have worked with local communities to organize themselves to, uh, for example, here a polar bear patrol in Russia that is um, watching out during the, the on land season to um, avoid polar bears in communities and exchange information. And um, we're testing new tools such as electric fencing, how to best in, uh, install that and keep bears out of communities or away from conflict zones. But each of the range states so far has been doing their own thing of how re they record data and how they store data and information. So um, in 2007, um, the range states came together and agreed that they need to work together on standardizing how they collect information on polar bear conflict and they created what's called the polar bear human information management system so they they work together on standardizing what information they all need and want and exchange to develop um, best management practices for example or just identify where they have problems initially this system was put into an access database um, but they quickly realized there's a lot of problems with that on, for example, exchanging critical sensitive information with each other. Um, the intent was to have one, one database, but then given personal information laws in the different countries that couldn't be realized. So I then um, started introducing the SMART at the time. In 2017, the um, range states agreed to start piloting SMART to see if this could be a way to replace the old access database that they had started and had individual versions in their own um, administrations. What they were looking for is a standardized reporting tool that they could report annually what they want to, you know, how many conflicts there are, how many bears injured, killed, people injured, killed. Um, they wanted a better way to collect data, mobile data collection, of course, the main thing that they wanted is user, um, easy user restrictions of who can access the data, view it, and extract information from the common database that they want. Efficient and cheap data storage. Um, in the Arctic, too, you oftentimes have data connection problems um, in remote areas. Integration of other data sources, such as harvest information or um, uh, research information, DNA collection, et cetera, and cross-conservation analysis. And so I said, well, 
with all these requirements you have, SMART would be perfect to pilot. So we did. And um, in 2017, we um, uh, worked with um, uh, the SMART partnership to develop then a data model for SMART in independent incidences and um, have tested it now at, as a pilot in a, a couple communities, but also uh, myself personally in the field. So we have done, we've transferred some of the data sheets that people have been using in the field to the data model and have been also testing equipment in the field, like what what uh, um, mobile phones can work in the cold with gloves on, um, what is the data capa uh, uh, battery capacity. So we're working on these initial field tests. Um, so this is just an example of what the smart mobile interface looks like. So we now have a standardized input interface with the minimum agreed variables that all the range states have agreed upon. And then each site has also identified additional information they want to collect. And um, so we have that in place. Um, we've also um, designed a standardized report that the range states want to have as an annual report with the minimum information they all want to share. And um, we have started working on uh, setting up Smart Connect. Um, so we have the concept and the database structure for each, and we're in the process right now to implement or install them on the individual government servers. And Norway is the first that we're working with right now as soon as Smart 7 comes out to install it on their ministerial server. Um, so for data collection, Um, just an example of what people want from this database. Um, so this is an example of a table that was extracted out of the access database, but basically this is the summary table everybody wants every year. You know, what's the level of conflict? Is it increasing, decreasing over the years? Um, and also just getting more information from different data yeah. sources, such as tourists or, or um, hunters or um, just visitors from the Arctic. Right now, it's basically only from the government agencies coming into the database. Um, the other thing that we want to use the data for and have, but in, in sort of ad hoc fashion is to create safety educational materials to minimize and mitigate human bear interactions. There's a lot of opinions with bears on land, what works best. For example, people have been well, saying what contradicting information, what works in deflecting a polar bear attack. So some say playing dead, some say bear spray, some bear hit in the face works well. Um, so what we've been doing with the data collection and initial test of historic data that we've actually now put into a smart database is does hitting a bear in the face actually work? And so we have now a standardized query that we did through the data and we can do this now every time um, when these information come in to do a, a quicker analysis across all range states and not have to sift through newspaper reports, et cetera. So uh, in fact, it does work uh, hitting bears in the face in case you wanted to know. Um, the future plans for smart integration is also being discussed. Um, there's a lot of, of course, research on aerial surveillance data, transect data, DNA sampling that we want to put into a national database, for example, discussing with the Norwegian um, team. And another one we've discussed is uh, co-management of harvest data, for example, in the co-management agreements between um, native communities and the federal government in the US, for example, they have a requirement to report harvest data. This could be one way where the communities collect their own data and then just report the results through a smart report. That This is in discussion. It's a plan for, for what we could use it for. Um, satellite data and radio caller data that's being collected in incident reporting. So there's a lot of plans and people see uh, COVID, of course, has put a little bit of a, um, a twist in this that we, we haven't really progressed in the last year as much as we could um, with, given Zoom trainings rather than in-person trainings, which I think is a main thing that is needed to advance SMART in the field is the in-person trainings. We've done two, but we need a lot more. So my 
objectives and our objectives for the range state is by 2023, we want to have SMART implemented and designated leads in each range state um, so that we have technical capacity and don't have to fly uh, people from Malaysia to, to the Arctic to do the trainings, but have people there um, to finish the SMART Connect site setup and interface uh, for SMART 7. We need to finish transferring out the old PBIMS data into the SMART database and field data collection and annual reports. So um, we have definitely our work cut out for the next year. And also we've been in discussion now, for example, the oil and gas industry in Alaska is required, of course, to collect every incident and interaction with polar bears in their areas and report it to the federal government. And they are very interested in testing um, SMART for for that, um, same with uh, tourist agencies, for example, in Svalbard that have to report interactions to um, the governor of Svalbard. So there's a lot of potential and we're, we're set with all the pre-work we've done over the years to do a lot over the next years. And finally get those dots on your map that was cut off with implementation sites of SMART in the North. Thank you. Thanks, Avila, that was amazing. Um... I really good to hear from the north and from such an incredibly different but also hugely threatened environment. I think what I find inspiring from this uh, presentation was the way that you could get different stakeholders to collaborate and where SMART was also allowing people to share data but at the same time keep privacy um, and concern uh, people that are concerned about the privacy and security matters separate as well. So I think that's just a really good lesson to learn um, that we'd like to take on board. So now we're going to come back home for me. Uh, we're going to come to Gonorijo, where Rumbi Maguero is going to tell us more about the way we are using SMART uh, in addition to our law enforcement monitoring and talking about canine and human wildlife con conflict uses. Thank you very much and afternoon everyone. My name is Rumbi Zai Maguro and I'm from Gonarejo Conservation Trust and I'm the monitoring and evaluation officer. And I'm so excited to be here. I'm just going to share some of the work we are doing here. Gonarejo is the second largest national park in Zimbabwe and we share a boundary with Mozambique and we form part of the Great Limpopo Transfrontier Conservation Area. We are quite a very large park and our law enforcement team is comprised of approximately 170 field ranges and our operations are coordinated from one central operational room with three administrative stations which are just located around the park and in a year we conduct approximately 1450 patrols that's an approximate we can it's a plus or minus and our patrol types range from mobile patrols, fixed base patrols, routine surveillance, border patrols, and many other. Then our law enforcement effort also includes other specialized units, with, such as the K9 unit and the intelligence unit. However, our conservation efforts are not only within the park, but we also have a um, community department which works with the communities adjacent to the park in issues to do with human wildlife conflict, liaising with the communities and also issues to do with livelihood and sustainable development in those areas. Just to give you a better understanding of our environment, this map shows the core area or our core conservation area, which is the one region one day. That's the national park and next to our park, we have different um, land pieces. We have some which are safari areas, some are conservancies, and we also have villages around. So for management purposes, our organization have divided the um, land into five sectors, which is CS1 to CS5. And within those five sectors, we have um, community department employees, which assist us with human wildlife conflict and liaising with the com communities and also livelihood projects. Then to add more to that and also to explain to you how we are involved with SMART, Konarajo National Park has always been involved with the implementation of SMART. 
from its visual inception and having one of the original pilot sites. And the recent advancement in the smart capabilities have allowed GNP to expand the use of smart beyond the, just the law enforcement, but also add in the canine team and the human wildlife conflict team. However, we are also looking forward to expand our operations our, or our implementation of the two to the tourism department, roads and infrastructure department, the rhino monitoring, and also hunt monitoring for the adjacent campfire areas so that we ensure that data recording is also, data capturing is also being done correctly in all those areas. To give you an overview of our community work, um, the general structure of our human wildlife uh, conflict mitigation program involves the villages, the community extension workers or community workers who are employed by the uh, Gona Regional Conservation Trust, we also have community liaison officers who are still under Gona Regional Conservation Trust. We have the senior area manager. Then outside the core area, we have supporting structures, which include the safari operators, the rural district council, and the rural district councils. Then within, we also have the monitoring and evaluation unit, which does the, the analysis of the human wildlife conflict data. When a report is communicated to our community department from the villages, it is passed on to the community workers or community extension workers who capture the monitoring, the human wildlife conflict data using smart mobile application. And then that data is then sent to our desktop where we have our data, data capturing click to do the data cleaning and then the monitoring and evaluation officer doing the analysis of the data. However, if the incident requires further actioning, we immediately pass the incident to the community liaison officer. And in case it takes long to get to our desktop, the community extension worker also communicates that to the community liaison officers, who then liaise with the area manager to see if they can do a problem animal control. And we have various ways of controlling such animals, including scaring and um, translocation. We also communicate with our supporting structures in areas where we are not mandated to do problem animal control so that we facilitate and ensure that the community's requests are attended to on time and reduce conflicts between those communities and wildlife from the park. Before the implementation of SMART within those departments, there were several challenges which uh, the team was facing from the data collection team to the community liaison officers and those challenges included lack of comprehensive, a comprehensive database, which fully supported their data collection and management needs. You'd find that they'll have a picture database and also a database with their human wildlife conflict information. And when you try to give a report on a certain conflict, it would be time consuming for you to scan through the images and try to match the exact image with the actual incident. The other challenge with the head was lack of a standard report with graphical presentation of the human wildlife conflict data for the community meetings. Some of our community members have a very low literacy level and it's, it becomes easier to communicate these incidences using visuals or graphs. And all along the team has not been able to do that or they would do it, but not in a standardized way. Then they also had to carry a huge amount of paper forms because of the various types of conflict which um, occurs in the communities, and also the amount of information which we require to understand the conflict from its causes, the mitigation measures which are being implemented, the mitigation measures which work and do not work, and also its impact on the ground. However, to reduce all these challenges, we decided to implement SMART with the team, and we managed to make a data model which suit all their data needs. And in addition to that, we also introduced smart mobile to the team to reduce the number of gadgets they carry and to also get rid of their vast amounts of paper which they needed to use. Then in addition to that, we also designed a standard report for the community liaison officers to use during their community engagement meetings, which made, easier, which made it easier for the department to communicate with the communities and also for our filing purposes. I'm going to be sharing that report with you in the next slide. So this is an example of the report which we made, and that's the report which they're using every time they want to communicate with the, commun the, with the villagers, and also they're sharing with other supporting um, 
operations or structures around the park so that everyone have an idea of what is taking place and also the mitigation measures which are being used and then people have can share that around. Then we, we are also using SMART with our K9 team. Uh, as I explained earlier, our law enforcement team has different supporting structures and the K9 team was introduced in August 2015. The team is a little bit different from the general law enforcement team. It actually depends on the use of dogs for their tracking of suspects. And because of that, their success is determined by two things, which is the dog's effort and also the dog handler's effort. In addition to that, their operations are slightly different in that they can work beyond the national park boundaries and they also assist the national security teams with roadblocks and raids. As a result, those team usually had challenges in trying to merge their data with the rest of the team as they have different kinds of patrol, patrol length, and also the, the nature of the data which they used to collect is quite different. In addition, they also have to track the health of their dogs and for them to be able to do that, they were now having to go back to a paper form to record the health and then they use smart with the rest of the team to record some of their effort, which ended up being a very tedious process for the team. And to help with that, we also then implemented smart with the team and currently they are using smart mobile to collect um, all their information. And I'm also very happy to say that we have also started using Smart Connect with the team. So they're now able to share their data wherever they are with us without them having to come and connecting their phones, laptops. So that has actually made life very easy for the data capturing person and also the team itself on the ground. Then we have also managed to create um, an easy standard report for them so that they can see both the success of their dogs and also the success of the dog handlers, which they also share with the person who trains them every time when they have their refresher courses. This has actually also reduced the amount of work which our data capturing person has to go through from capturing from a paper form to the computer and then having to do the data quality check again. So at, at least now with that particular team, we have reduced the load for her. Now she only has to do the data quality check and confirming some incidences with them, which makes it a little bit less time consuming for the person who go on the desk. This is an example of a report which we have created for them where they can see their effort, the performance of their dogs, the different patrols they have done, the mandates in the different areas which they have gone to. So we produce this every month and every time when they request for such kind of a report. Thank you so much, everyone. That's how we are implementing Smart Down in Zoom. Thanks, Rumbi. Appreciate that very much. Um, I just also can point out that the Conrejo Conservation Trust is a partnership between Frankfurt Zoological Society and uh, the Zimbabwe Parks and Wildlife Management Authority. So it's a sort of innovative co-management model. So it's a you know, really great way of being able to do effective conservation. Thanks, Rumbi, and especially those canines. Uh, I think we should have seen more pictures of the dogs. <laughs> okay, thanks. We're going to go to uh, Samantha Stringberg now um, to talk about the designing of surveys and collecting wildlife surveys data. Thanks, Sam, you can share your screen now. So hopefully that will have worked. And you can see my screen. Um, can you see my screen? Is it all good? Mm, nope. Mm. Yeah. I think it's coming. <laughs> it's just at the moment. It's saying it started screen sharing. Thinking about it. Double click to enter the full screen. It says I'm sharing. Should I stop it and try again? Yeah. Hmm. Not sure why. I'm not sure. I, I have just. I have two screens. I don't know if there's some unhappiness because I have two. Let me try again.
I think we can see your second screen now. We just can't see the presentation. Um, there we go. Thanks, Sam. I think we all set, all set to go. Well, thank you for inviting me to this series of talks in honor of Women's History Month. It's my great pleasure to be here. Um, I'm a wildlife st statistician within the Global Conservation Program of WCS, and I also work a lot with our conservation. Uh, sorry, Samantha, you are muted. How about now? Yeah, that's good. You uh, just got a bit of a buzz. Yes. But, um, yeah. Yeah. I hear you. So what I hope to do is be able to provide you with a brief introduction to Smart ER and places technolo technological innovation within the context of ecological monitoring, the selection of appropriate survey methods, as well as survey design and the analysis of the resulting data. And we already, already saw some nice examples from Colombia during Luisa's talk, and I will show you some examples from our Ndoki Likwala landscape in Northeastern Republic of Congo as I go along. So in a nutshell, Smart Ecological Records is a plugin that can be installed as part of the smart system to help with the collection and management of ecological data. And Smart ER mimics the hierarchical framework used for smart patrol data, and we'll look at the various elements in a little more detail in a moment. So basically, once you install Smart ER, a new survey menu with a number of options appears, and those options are available to you. Now, before we go into some of those details, it might be useful to cover a couple of definitions just to make sure we're all on the same page. Firstly, for our purposes here, when we talk about a survey, we mean the collection of a sample of observation-based field data. So generally, we mean human-based observations rather than camera trap data, video data, or other digital data. And the target of these surveys could be any of a large variety of animals, their sign, plants, habitat, or human-related features. And the surveys can be completed in a variety of habitats, either on foot or using a various, various modes of transport. And so clearly the survey method you use will depend on your target species and what your monitoring question is. And there are many more examples than the ones shown on this slide. But whatever survey method you do choose, ideally we want to use a random survey design to allow us to draw conclusions about our entire sort of survey area. So here is our Ndoki Likwala landscape in the Republic of Congo, um, where the conservation targets include forest elephants, great apes, both Western lowland gorilla and central chimps, um, African gray parrots, and a variety of ungulates. So here, the project lead was um, Terry Brinchik, and she used the distance software to generate this extensive design, which you can see involves a huge amount of survey effort across an enormous landscape, which includes the Nuobali and Doki National Park, Lactele Community Reserve in dark green, so, uh, surrounded by several logging concessions in lighter green, a swampy area in light blue, and then an, another area of interest southeast of Lactele Community Reserve called Batanga. So once you have the shape file with your design, then you can move on to importing it into Smart ER. And this um, survey design maps onto what's also referred to as a survey design within, this, within Smart ER pretty seamlessly, in that, that it's a template for survey data collection. Within Smart ER, one also defines a number of elements related to the survey design, namely the survey properties, mission properties, and the sampling unit definition. 
um, but there are no data associated with the survey design itself. Associated with the survey design within SmartER are the surveys where the observational data are collected by visiting all the sampling units at least once. And one or more missions then associated with each survey, which is basically a single complete set of survey data. And during the missions themselves, survey teams go to the field to collect the survey data. So once you've set up your survey design, your surveys and your missions, then you'd be basically ready to export this, the survey package and go to the field to collect data. And so each time the mission is completed and the survey team returns from the field, the data are imported into the main smart ER system from the mobile devices. And you would generally start by importing your tracks. And here you see an example of importing the data from the Congo survey. You can use the track editor to manipulate the track data so that it corresponds correctly to your sampling units as you've defined them as part of your survey design. And once you've, once you're imported your waypoint data, you'll also be able to see the observations on a map and that makes data validation a bit easier. So once the data have been imported, then you can move on to some survey queries. And in fact, you can use the query functions in SmartER to help with the data validation process, which is handy. So here's another example from Congo, uh, from the Congo survey, where you can see the results of a query to find the locations of illegal hunting camps. And as was mentioned in the previous talk, you can use these kinds of results then to create reports. And for the more complicated and comprehensive analyses, you need to export the data from SMART into whichever analysis software is needed for your particular survey data. So in the case of the Congo data, this required distance sampling analyses of the elephant dung data and the great ape data and the data from the rest for the rest of the species. And so we needed to do this either using the distance software or the distance library in R. Unfortunately, now there's an extra output option available in SMART that allows you to export the data in a more streamlined fashion for distance sampling analyses. So that's very helpful. So I think that was my very quick tour of Smart ER, and I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Thanks, Sam. Um, again, I just really great to see ER being used in this way and, and especially the robustness of the system. Uh, and again, the ability to, for, to, for people to know that they can export data and use it within other uh, software that they either has more higher capacity or would, that they would like to, to uh, share with other scientists. So that's, I just think for all of us, that's quite new to see, uh, see the, um, SMART being used in that way. Okay, I think we're getting to the future of SMART now. Um, we're moving over to uh, Lily at uh, Harvard, We're going to tell us more about AI and to predict poaching and illegal logging uh, through a new smart development called PAUSE. Thank you so much, MCV, and for um, all the organizers and all the other wonderful um, people on, who have presented so far today. Oh. So as, as as mentioned, um, I'm going to be talking about uses of, of AI to predict poaching and illegal logging. And unlike many people um, on this call and who have been speaking so far, my background is not in conservation, but um, rather in computer science. So I'm a researcher 
at Harvard, um, and I've been working with uh, many different people on the SMART team at various sites uh, for the past couple of years on how to build good predictive models um, to add to all of the wonderful features on SMART. Um, so um, if you weren't before today, by now you're very familiar with the SMART system and all the many capabilities that it offers, um, including tracking, uh, monitoring, um, data collection, surveys, all this visualization. But one thing that SMART um, lacks at the moment is any sort of predictive or prescriptive capabilities. So that's where we are filling in the gap um, in partnership um, with SMART and um, a team at Microsoft on their AI for Good initiative who are offering us um, some cloud computing support and engineering support as well. So I'm going to be talking about exactly how um, the system works and how we're going about it. So the, um, the AI system that we've developed is called the Protection Assistant for Wildlife Security, or PAWS. And what PAWS does is take as input all of the information about uh, historical patrols, as well as the geography of the park. So this can come in the form of um, shape files or raster images. Um, and you can have things about the roads, rivers, land cover um, of the park. Um, we process all of that and you can add just anything that's relevant to your park. So if you have if surveys about animal density or where the water holes are or where near, nearby villages are, we can all take that as input into our system. Um, and the output um, is a predictive risk map. And you can configure this um, by season. So here we're looking at um, dry season versus rainy season. Um, we're looking at the overall risk, um, and you can also configure this to have different months or different um, grid cell sizes. And there's a little bit of, of magic that's happening in the arrow um, for us to be able to make these predictions. Um, so the, the images that I just showed um, are from Tripak Wildlife Sanctuary in Cambodia, where we've been working um, in collaboration with WWF. And just to get a sense of what's at stake, Shipak is home to a population of elephants, elves, deer, clouded leopard, and bangtang, among uh, many others. And it's a, a fairly large park right on the border with Vietnam. Okay, so the data that we have from Shipak um, come in the form of these patrol observations on SMART. So, um, for example, over this five, this six-year period, um, between 2013 and 2018, we had over 40,000 patrol observations. Um, and what we do is process that into um, here, what I'm showing are one by one square cells into the historical patrol effort. Um, and you can see there's sort of like the, the main roads where there've been a lot of patrol efforts are where there's a national highway and the main roads in the park. Um, and then we can also isolate the historical illegal activity. And this um, are, are different options that we select. So specifically, we're looking at snares, bullet cartridges, people cited, um, human signs, campsites, carcasses, and more. Um, and what we get out of this is a predictive risk map of relative poaching risk around the park. Um, and what you notice, for example, is that the poaching risk map does not um, correlate exactly with where we've seen illegal activity, but rather um, we're predicting high risk of poaching, for example, in the Northeast region, where there have been historically few patrols because the area is not very blue there, it's, it's almost white. Um, and this is interesting to us because like, okay, we're predicting this area to have a lot of poaching risk, uh, but we the rangers haven't really seen much illegal activity there before and they haven't even patrolled it very much. And, and what turns out is, again, um, this area of the park is right along the border with Vietnam. And what's happening is there are a lot of um, a lot of poachers coming across that international boundary into the park illegally to place a lot of elephant traps. So there are more of the big game hunters rather than um, bushmeat or other types of, of poachers. And at that time, um, they did not have um, very concentrated patrol effort in Shripak to visit that northeastern region. Um, but during one of our field tests, which I'll talk about in the next slide, uh, we had suggested to the rangers to go um, patrol that area and they were just sort of excited and surprised by, by their findings over there that they asked us to keep setting um, them different locations in that region, which was very exciting to us. So um, the way that we conducted these field tests um, was well, our objective was to try to evaluate our predictive performance and 
are the predictions that we're making actually sensible and are they helpful to the rangers at all? And what you see here is a map of, um, of one of the, the field tests that we conducted in December 2018 um, with the rangers here in Sheep Park. So what we did was select 15 different regions in the park. Um, and some of the five of these were high risk regions, five of them were or our model predicted to be low risk regions, and five of them were medium risk regions. And we uh, um, share these with the rangers. We did not tell them in advance um, what the, the predicted poaching risk was at each of these regions. And we also focused on um, sending them to regions that had historically low patrol so that we weren't relying on historical patterns, but rather trying to make predictions about the future. And here's a picture of um, a team of rangers in Shripak after uh, one patrol with the snares and three chainsaws that they confiscated. Um, and the results of our field tests were extremely promising. So the chart here shows the, um, the captures per unit effort in the high risk regions in which they found many more snares per square kilometer um, per square kilometer patrolled and um, basically no snares in the low risk region and many fewer in the medium risk regions. Um, and in fact, in a single month, they had um, found and removed over a thousand snares. And in comparison, in other months in 2018, they were typically finding about 200 snares a month. So this is extremely exciting both to us and to them. And in fact, we got this email from Rohit Singh who leads the zero poaching initiative at WWF saying, I am super excited with the results. Let's get this going on other countries too this year. And that's what we're doing with the deployment of pause on SMART, which is an ongoing process. And uh, many people on this call, including Rumbi and Zia, who will be speaking next, um, have been helping us with doing initial tests of the pause system on SMART. Um, and I want to emphasize that all, even though we are computer scientists, um, all of this has been done in close collaboration with the park rangers and with um, members of the SMART partnership. Um, so in this picture on the left is Alex Wyatt, who I noticed is on this call. Hi, Alex. <laughs> um, so we actually had the opportunity of spending a week in Shripak, um, chatting with the rangers, accompanying them on a patrol, and just getting a better sense of how their operations were, what the challenges um, what that they were experiencing. Um, and leading up to these tests, we had um, very regular phone calls and email meetings. And with the smart deployment, um, as Monica well knows, we've been having at first weekly uh, meetings every single Thursday starting in June through December. Um, and now we're, we're meeting only twice a month, but it's been a very um, iterative process um, and we're very, very grateful for this partnership. Okay. okay. So this is what we've done so far with PAUSE, and I'll talk a little bit about um, the, the current um, projects that we're working on to make our poaching predictions and illegal logging predictions and human animal wildlife conflict predictions a little bit better. So um, among the smart sites around the world, um, some of them, like Shripak, are very well patrolled. They have a lot of historical patrol observations. So we can leverage this information to build a good predictive model of poaching patterns. But there are other parks, such as Royal Balloon in Malaysia, that have historically few patrols. And as you see, many of the areas of the park had not been explored at all. So it's a challenge um, here to to figure out how can we make predictions because we don't really have good historical data to, to leverage. Um, so as a result of this, um, we're working on a, a new algorithm in computer science um, called dual mandate patrols. So pause as it stands focuses on making predictions in these relatively data rich parks where we can use all this historical information and build good predictive models. But for data scarce parks, we have to simultaneously conduct patrols to detect illegal activity while also improving the predictive model. So we have to balance exploring uncertain areas while also making sure that we don't neglect known hotspots. And trying to navigate this trade off um, becomes really interesting um, from an algorithmic perspective, but also um, is an important use case um, in conservation as well. Um, and we actually have um, published papers um, on, on all of this work. So this, um, these insights have been shared with the computer science community as well as deployed to the conservation community as well. So it's just really exciting to be working at this interface between disciplines. 
And another challenge with these data scarce parks is that even though they might have good uh, past patrolling records, they might not have a lot of um, information about the park because they just don't have GIS um, experts um, or they don't have animal density surveys and all of these things. So what we've also worked on um, is trying to supplement the geospatial information that parks have with publicly available satellite imagery through Google Earth Engine. Um, and uh, we have uh, a paper published on this um, with Drew Cronin, who I also noticed on the call. Hi, Drew. Um, and what this enables us to do is take in all of this publicly available information specialized to a park and get information about the elevation, land cover, um, gross primary productivity, and DVI, among other things. Okay. Um, so just a very, very quick overview about what PAWS um, enables us to do. As mentioned, uh, we can select different spatial resolutions so we can figure out um, what poaching patterns are like in one by one kilometer regions or five by five or anywhere in between. Um, and we can also um, choose between different illegal activity targets. So for example, in Roy Bellum State Park, they have different kind of classes of poachers who all um, place different kinds of snares in the park. So they have Indo-Chinese poachers who are mostly big game poachers placing large traps, and they have songbird poachers who are placing very small traps. So because this is all recorded separately and smart, we can make separate predictions about the poaching patterns of all of these different um, poacher activities as well. Okay. Um, so what we're currently working on are instituting these field tests of pause um, in other sites throughout Southeast Asia and Africa to ensure that these predictions scale well there. Um, we're working on patrol route planning. So instead of just offering a risk map of poaching probabilities, we're trying to figure out um, how can we actually suggest um, good uh, patrol routes or good patrol sites to rangers. And we're also trying to think about how we can model poacher behavior and then plan patrols in response. Um, so this is what I have. Thank you so much, um, everybody. And here's how to find me on the internet. <laughs> Thanks, Lily. Um, I found that really interesting. And I think just usually exciting to see that next level um, set of tools coming available to help improve effectiveness and impact. And I think also for many of us looking at how we can more strategically allocate our resources, I think that's gonna be a big game changer for us. Uh, thanks, Zia. Um, uh, sorry, thanks, Lily. We're going to Zia now uh, and Lily uh, Leeling just to talk about Smart Integrate. We're coming to the end of our presentations. We're running a little bit short of time. Let's see how it goes. There's a number of questions in the, in the chat, which we will be addressing at the end of this time, but thanks. We're gonna start and just, uh, Gives the end uh, leading a chance now. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. Are you able to see our screen? Yes, yes. Okay, great. So, hi. We'll, we'll, we'll try to speed through and make sure we end on time. Um, so I'm Li Ling, I'm with WCS. I'm here with my colleague Zia from Panthera and we're both co-leads at the Smart Integrate Task Force, um, a group of smart users to oversee and guide best practices for all integrations for the smart suite of tools. So we're here to give you a sneak peek about a exciting new initiative called Smart Integrate, which makes the integration and use of sensor data in Smart easy. Smart Integrate is a partnership of Smart and Earth Ranger. Uh, Earth Ranger, like SMART, is a protected area management solution, but it's primarily focused on real-time operations. It ensures protected area managers have a 360 view um, of every single thing that's happening in a protected area, from the location of rangers, vehicles, the location of wildlife, to other assets they might have. Um, it's also used in other areas, such as ecological management and supporting human wildlife management. So SMART and Earth Ranger are been coming together in the last uh, year or so uh, to create a more powerful end-to-end -end protected area management solution, combining traditional law enforcement monitoring, real-time operations, wildlife monitoring, and intelligence. Uh, we're doing this by aligning our software development efforts, uh, including support and training of programs. So as part of this effort, um, both SMART and Earth Ranger realized that both of our tools and our other peer conservation tools out there um, have the same need to integrate with a vast array of field sensors. Uh, given there's so many sensor devices being used and we don't want to force our communities 
to pick a winner, to choose just one, two, three options and be locked in. Uh, we wanted to create an open and flexible uh, data integration platform where any field sensor can be integrate, integrated. Just a smart integrate. As we said, a smart integrate is a new initiative to build a coalition of sensor technology providers, users to create a tool that will provide a number of out of the box integrations with field sensors that will allow data to be made available uh, from a sensor in Smart, Earth Ranger, or any other conservation application. Um, our vision is to simplify the deployment of sensors uh, into protected areas. There were a couple of challenges that Smart Integrate is seeking to solve. Um, we want to you know, reduce the redundancy. Right now, there's a lot of redundant manual efforts to create integration, um, lots of different applications out there that a protected area has to manage through. And very often protected areas have to actually hack together their own custom integration. New CSV imports move data from one system to another. Um, this, this causes a confusing kind of situation and makes integrations a little bit out of reach uh, for protected areas. Um, kind of related to that, uh, limited data standards can be another challenge for efficient data exchange. Um, and then when it comes to bigger commercial providers, um, working together in Spark Integrate as this platform where integrations with multiple tools is available uh, will give us a much high, uh, stronger voice there. And also by having one data integration platform, you know, quality assurance maintenance will be simplified as a central surface across multiple systems. So the core reason that Smart Integrate um, sort of came to be is to serve protected area staff. So Smart Integrate offers protected area staff a turnkey solution for your sensor data. With one tool, you can bring in your data collected from a variety of different sensor devices, uh, your camera traps, your acoustic monitoring, uh, and use that data in apps like Smart and Earth Rangers. So you don't have to worry about compatibility issues, manual data transformation, and all the other custom apps uh, and integrations available. And also gives you device independence. So you can mix and match your hardware with your software, again, without worrying about compatibility. Um, and Smart Integrate also allows you to view your data, you know, from all these different devices in a single app. So you don't have to ma manage your data in silos. Um, importantly, Smart Integrate will reduce your administrative and overhead costs. Uh, Smart Integrate also has a lot of benefits for sensor and AI developers. Um, with one simple integration, data from your technology can be pushed into multiple apps, like again, like Smart Nurse Ranger, uh, opening up a wide range of possibilities. Uh, you don't have to worry about maintenance and managing all your different endpoint applications. Smart Integrate handles this. Uh, and then you just you know, join an active community of conservationists who will give you ongoing community feedback. Um, for application developers, our you know, peer organizations uh, to Smart Earth Ranger um, who want to receive data from multiple sensors, Smart Integrate is also offers a great single point of integration. So all you need to do is connect to Smart Integrate the data and then you have access for, from data from hundreds of sensors. So applications like SMART um, can focus our limited resources on doing you know, our development more effectively and just have a wider access to data to work at scale. Um, and then with the community behind it, we can solve problems quicker and easier and more efficiently. So yeah, I'm gonna pass this over to you. Great, thank you, Liling. Obviously, now with a whole lot of protected area managers using several different types of sensors. We can't hear you, Zia. I think you're muted. Um, Sia, can you still hear us or, um? Hi, sorry. Yes, I'm here. Cool. Can you hear me? 
Yes, we can. We would just, oof. Okay. Sorry, everyone. My internet, I'm in the bush and my internet has been working fine right up until <laughs> the moment I was about to present. So that's wonderful. Um, cool. So just leading on to what uh, Lee Ling was saying, um, protected area managers all across the globe now, obviously with technology advances happening, we're all using a lot more field sensors and a lot more technology. Um, and we need to find ways to streamline this into a more integrated approach and into a more streamlined um, management basis. So um, how do we use Smart Integrate? So basically it's, it's as easy as this. So if you're a, a database admin, um, you'll be setting up whatever inbound connection of what data you want to bring in. And um, then you'll be choosing your outbound destination of where you want it to be fed to. So that's basically it. That's how it's gonna look. Um, and it's as easy as that. Um, so as an example, um, once your database has been set up with Smart Integrate for your data, you select uh, which sensor you want to come in and you choose where you want it to go to. So as an example here, we have um, integrations coming into Smart Connect as alerts and as independent incidences. And then also because Smart Integrate is going to have several um, endpoints, multiple endpoints. You can use the same data that you're seeing in Smart in um, software packages such as EarthRanger. Cool. So the idea is that Smart Integrate is going to make it easy for protected area staff to integrate their field sensor devices with and use Smart for conservation apps. Um, so we're just going to walk you through a couple quite high level cases um, of where Smart Integrate might help you on the ground. Um, obviously, there's several different ones that there could be. These are just a few that we've pulled out. So as a protected area manager, um, you obviously are wanting to plan good and effective patrols. Smart Integrate, as an example, will allow me to use my wildlife data collected by my animal tracking collars from the field and plug this directly into Smart itself. I can then use this information that I'm getting from my animal movements to plug into um, things like paws, which Lily just talked about, um, to better assist me, better assist me in planning my patrols. Um, so that's one, one use of it. Um, another use, I think lots of people, probably some on this call are using the Global Forest Watch uh, fire alerts. Um, so as a ranger, you obviously want to be informed as much as possible of what's happening then and there on the ground. Smart Integrate will help find ways to get that connection from places like Global Forest Watch and directly send them into your smart mobile device so that you can have that information then and there with you in one place in the field. Um, as an operations manager, the data that Smart Integrate sends to Earth Ranger will help you to monitor your animals, your rangers, your patrols, your vehicles, your aircrafts, and any other assets you might have in real time, which lets you manage your day-to-day -day operations and helps you respond more quickly to these events when they happen. Um, Smart Integrate for ecological monitoring and research. Um, as we know, as people that are researchers, we have a lot of sensors going on in the field, whether it be camera traps, whether it be telemetry data, whatever it might be. Um, Smart Integrate is gonna help us take all of that information from these um, technologies and sensors and really feed that into um, one system in Smart and help us help stop us from having to enter it in one place and then move it to another one, like uh, Li Ling was saying. Um, do that all automatically for us. Um, and then Smart Integrate has already been in conversations with um, organizations like Move Bank. So it will really help um, using Smart Integrate to have all this data go to places like Move Bank um, for global conservation research. Cool. Sorry, am I still connected? Yes, yeah, we good? can hear you. Okay. 
cool. Um, so yeah, most importantly, Smart Integrate is going to be for everyone. I think almost everyone here is using these quite complicated uh, field sensors nowadays. Um, and one of the most important things to know is that your investment into making these new camera traps and things that you're using that you can evidence that these are going to help you um, and that these whole new system without having to learn a whole new system. So that's really what we're trying to achieve here with Smart Integrate. And I'm going to hand back Thank over you. to Li Ling for what's it. <laughs> Yeah, we're, I'm going to try to wrap this up as quickly as possible. Uh, we just wanted to get to tell you a little bit about what's ahead with uh, Smart Integrate. Uh, first, uh, just so you know that Smart Integrate went, went into beta release last year, and it's right now a release candidate. So it's a fully functional product uh, that we continue to build new integrations for. Um, when Smart 7 is publicly released, uh, Smart Integrate can enter a managed release. So users can, uh, trusted users can start to use Smart Integrate and Smart 7 together in practice. Uh, so, and finally, keep an eye out for Smart Integrate's public release in September. Uh, additionally, uh, Smart Integrate, we believe we're much stronger in partnership and in community. So we've been working to have conversations, meetings, and um, build a community with hardware AI developers, conservation application developers, and users of sensor data. Um, we, we were, you know, hoping to, the more partnerships we have with different providers, um, and developers, the more, uh, integrations we'll have in Smart Integrate. Uh, so this is just a, a sampling of the, the partner, the, uh, integrations that have been completed or in, in pipeline for Smart Integrate. Uh, but lastly, uh, we want to know what's important to smart users. We want to know what uh, sensor integrations, what, what field sensors you're using, and what would be most important for you to be able to connect that data into SMART. Um, so we put out a survey yesterday on the SMART Community Forum. Uh, the link is on the slide in which we'll post in the chat. And um, we encourage you, if you're using sensors, uh, please give us some feedback. This helps us prioritize uh, what integrations uh, go into SMART Integrate. That's it. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate uh, this whole Thanks, webinar Li Ling. series. Great. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Li Ling. Thanks, Zia. Um, yeah, that was, uh, I mean, I think what's really exciting, so many people are looking for real-time feedback. Um, and as you say, people are investing in all sorts of devices, but it is becoming very confusing to know how to in and, uh, I think one of the things we mentioned about the smart partnership is this collaboration of different organizations so we don't have to be competing with each other and I think uh, looking at the next levels I'm just really glad to see that that kind of ethos is being uh, taken forward um, and I just would really, yeah this is going to be really interesting the next few months to see how this rolls out um, congratulations and really looking forward to seeing how that where we where we're at in by September Monica I don't know we're running out of time a little bit I don't know if we want to just do a quick quick uh, question and answer session or what 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 do you suggest Yes, maybe we can do just a couple of questions very quickly. Um, we have answered most of the questions in the chat. There's a question for Lili Zhu. What tool did you use for the predictive modeling for risk map and patrol sites? Yes, um, thank you for that question. I had responded, I think, in a private message, but the, the tool that we're using um, is the pause software that we've developed, um, and that's all. Um, software that we have um, coded and and set up ourselves but then for the visualizations that's using gis software qgis that helps and happy to um, chat more about it via email thank you lily um there was a question about where you can download the uh, ecological records plugin you can download all the plugins from the website um, I think Sam already answered the question about population sensors. Um, Sam, if we do a population census of an animal species other than distance sampling, what other methods can we use on ecological records? Yeah, basically um, anything that's ob observation based. So it will very much depend on, on your, this, your sort of species you're working with. But um, 
anything like double double observer methods or occupancy methods based on detection on detection data. So there's yeah, there's, there are a lot of choices. Thank you. Um, I have shared the link with everyone for the forum. So any additional questions, please join the smart community forums a great resource for everything about smart and every we have such a, a great helpful community everyone's really um, helpful and um, chips in so feel free to use that resource and um, LCB can we wrap it up now I think it's it was such a great uh, webinar thank you so much for all the amazing presenters thank you so much for all of you who joined us from all the different parts of the world we'll be sharing the the recordings in our YouTube channel and stay safe, everyone. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks, Monica, and thanks, everyone. I think it's just how we've come. I think we're going to have a formal 10-year celebration soon for SMART. Um, and I think we had early days where we didn't, weren't sure whether we'll be able to have this sort of larger rollout. And just to be here today and to see this amazing diversity of people and organizations is uh, is a very hot, heartwarming. And just to see that also next level stuff coming forward, we're also saying we wanna keep true to our roots, make sure that this works on, you know, from uh, pretty basic environments to very high, um, uh, uh, sort of high and, capacity uh, environments. So just, just to be able to see all of these tools being, being out there is just amazing. So thanks very much. And uh, yeah, let's look, there's, I think there's a few more forums coming, uh, webinars coming up in the near future. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thanks so much. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody.